what we've uncovered is just an incredible collection of not only research teams, but testing laboratories and a lot of legacy stuff that has existed in pockets and has been very successful. You know, nuclear engineering has done all kinds of great NASA work. We have a hypervelocity impact chamber that we can simulate like micrometeoroid impacts on new materials. We have a center for radiation engineering and science for space exploration that can do, and it's one of a kind, I think in the country, if not in the world, a facility that can do like any kind of incident beam that you want to from, it can emulate solar flares, proton events, uh, galactic cosmic radiation, all kinds of UV, of course. And so we have these, and that's, that's just a couple. I could literally go on. I have a laundry list of laboratory facilities and researchers that as we begin stitching together and understanding what everybody's doing, we've really coalesced a, a very comprehensive suite of technology development areas that we can bring both in the pure science, kind of lunar science investigations, as well as tech development. So, uh, you know, I'm really leading this initiative in space engineering and construction. Hey, this is Jason Cadigan, the host of the Cold Star Project. I'm here with Nicole Shoemaker. She is a research specialist at Texas A&M. And her whole thing is like uh, lunar construction and, and all that neat stuff. Um, so I wanted to have her on because she has this unique role in kind of being the glue that, that sticks everything together. So l let's talk a little bit about um, how you got into this role. I mean, it's not something you just wake up and go, hey, I'm going to do this one day. Well, that's a good question. I actually have a background in earth and atmospheric sciences and did a lot of research as an undergraduate. Um, that was many, many moons ago, uh, but I think it served me well because it really gave me a really good appreciation for how, um, how tedious it is to get real data to support modeling, numerical modeling efforts. This was way back in the day of early climate change research and global atmospheric models. And I worked on an experimental team as well as a numerical modeling team. And I was very passionate about the work I was doing, but didn't see uh, an opportunity at the time that I wanted to pursue. And I really wanted to get into industry where I felt like I could make a difference bringing technologies out of the lab and into the marketplace. So that's really what I've spent my career doing. And there are actually um, several parallels that uh, throughout the different uh, positions and companies that I've worked with are, are related now. Mm -hmm. But I really got into the space industry a couple of years ago, right after the, um, the executive directive or the Space Policy One um, directive came from the National Space Council to return to the moon to establish a permanent lunar and robotic or a human and robotic presence. And when I started looking around at what was going on, I realized that there was this whole new industry that was emerging um, uh, that was, uh, you know, really seated in the private sector, the large kind of incumbent, you know, old school um, aerospace companies are certainly big players, but there's a whole new crop of startups uh, that are coming out. And so, because of my experience really working at those early stages of market development and technology, you know, kind of helping drive product development based on market needs. Um, I thought maybe I can, maybe I can be of some use and value here. So I started going to conferences. Um, I was working with uh, uh, Ad Astra rocket company, Franklin Cheng Diaz, very uh, graciously offered me an opportunity to work with his team to do some connection and market and business development um, out of the Bay Area and, and uh, also out of his Costa Rican operations. And in going to conferences for that role, I started learning what was kind of happening on the construction side, you know, where the lunar civil engineering sort of um, challenges and uh, opportunities were going to be. I was working with, um, the department head here of construction science at Texas A&M was a former, he was actually at the Air Force Academy when I was at Autodesk and we had done some work together there. And when we reconnected, he wanted to do some seminal research. And so this, we started to see these connection points between what was already going on at A&M, but wasn't really um, necessarily kind of focused on lunar construction, but there are construction methodologies, especially on the material science side, that are very, very applicable, um, that are being developed already for military and expeditionary uh, type construction. 
And in that realm, a and is very seasoned, very experienced, and, and has, a, has an incredible team of very rigorous material scientists um, across the board, both for you know, manufacturing type materials, but also for construction uh, and infrastructure type projects. So it just sort of uh, organically grew. And as I met folks at NASA, like uh, Rob Mueller and the team at Swampworks and started to understand what they were doing. And Rob Mueller is actually the one that said to me, we really need someone to work. We really need a team to work more on the materials. And when we started to understand what the materials um, science challenge was, because we don't have lunar samples that we can just go grab and analyze and start building with. I mean, we have some, but they're very difficult to come by. Some of them haven't even been released. Some of the Apollo samples are still under lock and key until, you know, we determine that we're really ready and can handle them and analyze them with our most uh, mature, you know, experimental te techniques and instruments. So in the meantime, there's a lot we can do to kind of experiment with that. So that's where we found our niche and that's what we're, what we're growing. It's grown into so much more than that, but that was really the, the kind of entry point. Okay, how did you get uh, involved with Texas A&M? That was through this uh, partnership or the connection that I had with uh, Dr. Patrick Sewerman, who is the head of construction science department. He started in 2017 and uh, like I mentioned, he was at the Air Force Academy. He was an instructor in civil engineering and really le led the building information modeling program there, um, which is, as you, your listeners may or may not, I guess this is a, a much broader audience, but the construction industry is very steeped in, um, in BIM. It's basically 3D parametric modeling of uh, building from the structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, you know, all the way through construction sequencing. And it's basically just putting everything into like a virtual, you know, uh, digital twin is the, is, the, is the term that's used in this industry. So um, anyway, we did uh, a, a really great uh, collaboration together there. And it was all about bringing together these interdisciplinary teams that were dispersed. I, I assembled a volunteer team essentially of subject matter experts across um, Autodesk, both uh, in the US and in the UK. And we took um, a project, you know, from kind of inception through completion, and it was a, a really high profile project for the Academy. And because of that, we just started brainstorming. Uh, we worked really well together, and I knew he wanted to do some, um, some really cutting edge new stuff for construction. And um, as we, again, both started to, to see kind of where things were going, we saw this as, a, as an un, uh, kind of an un, unfilled uh, need in the industry so that's that's how it that's how it ended up being at a m initially but it was an experiment to begin with right and it really needed to be validated through these gates of what are the capabilities that we can bring you know there's a, there's a very strong aerospace uh department you know our aerospace engineering department has two former astronauts who i'm very fortunate to be teamed with now on a couple of projects and what we've uncovered is just an incredible collection of not only research teams, but testing laboratories and a lot of legacy stuff that um, has existed in pockets and has been very successful. You know, nuclear engineering has done all kinds of great NASA work. Uh, we have a hypervelocity impact chamber that we can simulate like micrometeoroid impacts on new materials, but it hasn't really that much been used for that purpose. It's been used more for kind of ballistics like military studies. We have a center for radiation and science for space, space exploration, radiation engineering and science for space exploration that can do, and it's one of a kind, I think in the country, if not in the world, of um, a facility that can do like any kind of incident beam that you want to from, it can emulate solar flares, proton events, uh, galactic cosmic radiation, all kinds of UV, of course. And so we have these, and that's, that's just a couple. I could literally go on. I have a laundry list of laboratory facilities and researchers that as we begin stitching together and understanding what everybody's doing, we've, we've really coalesced a, a very um, comprehensive suite of, of uh, 
technology development areas that we can bring both in the pure science, uh, you know, kind of lunar science exploration as far as our investigations as well as um, tech development. So that's really kind of what the role is morphed into um, is a convener and uh, you know, I'm really leading this initiative in space engineering and construction. But we've also formalized, um, began to formalize the Texas A&M Space Alliance because we recognize that we're not the only ones who didn't realize all the stuff that's going on that we have access to. So we're, we're pulling that together and we're actually, we're supposed to launch that formally at South by Southwest. Um, hmm. And now that'll be, that'll <laughs> yeah. be, you know, stay tuned. It'll happen. Gotta find another way. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Well, I, I find it interesting that the role has morphed from, from what it was originally. Um, it seems to me, I mean, we've had Dr. Paul Zuzante on this show. Uh, mm -hmm. Chris Dreyer, Dr. Chris Dreyer at uh, Colorado School Mines. of Mines, yourself, mm -hmm. Dr. Daniel Britt, uh, who mm -hmm. runs class, which you've yep. spoken at. I'm going to ask yep. you about that a little bit later. And okay. so I got the feeling as, as a total newbie walking into this, oh, there's all these people kind of doing stuff out there, and they're not always aware of th that another person is working on something similar or something complementary. And so I'm getting the feeling that your mission is to sort of pull this stuff together and be a central point for it and say, look, everyone, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but this is going on here. Is that, is that, that kind is of a reflection? Exactly, okay. Yes, that's a great reflection. And it's very much what I want to convey in, in, in general, one of our anchoring, um, I call it an anchoring, anchoring initiative of the extraterrestrial engineering construction program, but it's really more of like an ethos that we are not trying to, um, you know, reinvent the wheel or, you know, compete in an, in an area where we're, not, we, you know, we're not adding more value or, or, you know, others have certainly come before us and gone um, much further in areas that it doesn't make sense for us to try to duplicate. What we want to do is assemble. Hmm. Really, it's, I call it um, radical collaboration, <laughs> hmm. uh, you know, and what I do is I'm essentially a radical facilitator and my mission is it, certainly it's to, you know, promote and bring opportunities to Texas A&M, but a step beyond that is really to solve, to help solve these lunar surface operational challenges that we're going to be faced with and to start to put as much, um, you know, that methodology in place as we can, you know, before we, you know, get there because these things take so much time to build mm -hmm. and scale and test at scale. So, to your point of, you know, uh, Paul Van Sassante, for example, is someone that I have, uh, that I took some guidance from, you know, early on, and I keep apprised of our work, and we're now partnered on a, an opportunity. Um, uh, you know, we're on a, a team together on, a, on an opportunity, and I would like to certainly develop more collaborations, also with mines. And um, I have, you know, in my long-term strategy, some ideas about, you know, really formalizing more of that kind of coalition, assuming everybody's wanting and willing. So, you know, I don't want to speak for them and say, this is what we're doing, but that's where I think we can, in a lot of ways on the material side, we have a very, very advanced uh, set of capabilities. Also on the system integration side, also on our just ability to scale because we have so much space. And we have so much investment going into developing an entirely new research um, arena of indoor and outdoor uh, technologies. And we also have very strong ties to the military. We have the Army Futures Command uh, Technology and Development um, Center is going in at our Relis campus, which is next to the building that I work in, which is the Center for Infrastructure Renewal, which is a $80 million, 150,000 square foot civil engineering playground. I mean, it has, you know, every capabilities from like the very, um, you know, nano micro scale uh, advanced characterization of materials all the way up to, uh, you know, a full system high bay with seismic testing capabilities. And, um, you know, so, it, it, and all of the all kinds of control, you know, chambers for doing temperature and humidity control. And it's, it would, I could spend a whole session talking about that facility, but, um, but we're looking to, to bring whatever pieces that we have to bear and to continue to be conveners. And also because we're centrally located, 
and we're so close to Johnson. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we have very strong relationships, um, especially from my aerospace uh, collaborators and our chancellor, John Sharp, working with the, um, the leadership at Johnson Space Center. And uh, there are, you know, outreach uh, efforts going on with private industry there that we're hosting. So, so yeah, it, it definitely is a, a matter of kind of bringing it together so that we can continue to say, is what we're working on still of, is this the most value or should we, you know, maybe pivot a little bit and things are developing so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, what's so exciting about this time. You know, everybody, uh, my hat's off to all the researchers that have been doing this their entire or, you know, better part of their careers um, without an actual program, you know, to, to fund it and to really, to really go after. Mm -hmm. So you know, a new call just came out today for the payloads. Um, it's called PRISM. It's the, the, the payloads uh, funding program for all of the CLIPS missions, you know, that are going to be going over the next 10 years. So this is going to, you know, kick up a lot of really good new stuff. Um, and we want to be, we definitely want to be a part of that. So. Hmm. And it's fascinating to think about these uh, large facilities that are out there where work is being done and most people have no idea these things exist. So, <laughs> and, and we I, would actually yeah. like to build larger, larger scale facilities of the uh, lunar environment, you know, to, to as closely mimic mm. the lunar environment, you know, give realistic testing conditions. So right. that's something and, else that's in our pipeline. Anyone who wants to hear more about what those conditions are like, go listen to that interview with Paul Van Suzante yeah. because everything you think you know about something as simple as like being a child and scooping up some dirt is wrong when it comes yep. to the moon. It's all backwards and everything's sharp and very finely particulate and there's no gravity basically. So, you know, if you violently scoop, you're going to kick up all this dust and yeah. uh, that, that sharp material is going to chew up your everything, everything. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, it is, it is absolutely wild. So what are some, like maybe if you want to share a couple of gaps that you've noticed in, uh, Hey, we need this sort of technological capability. Um, what, what well, you one noticed? you just mentioned actually is really key. The, 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 the morphology of the simula of the regolith itself mm. is it's extraordinarily abrasive. Um, it has uh, very little cohesion. And from mm -hmm. what I understand from listening to Phil Metzger's uh, talks, we don't even know why exactly. Mm. Uh, we kind of know how it's behaving, why it's, or, you know, what we can expect from Apollo missions, but we don't necessarily understand the physics behind it yet. Um, or not the physics, but the characteristics, you know, that, that make it so. Um, and determining um, when it's important to consider those characteristics of the lunar soil is really important because we have a, a host of simulants. Um, and the class uh, has done an excellent job of setting up a laboratory and even being able to make you know, the simulants that you want, whether you're looking at a highland uh, region or a mare region, um, you know, those vary substantially in terms of uh, chemical composition. And they have simulants that they've used, like uh, from, there's one called Black Point One that Swampworks uses, that is sort of geotechnically accurate, they find in terms of like the grain size and shape and and uh, they can get a whole bunch of it for, for, you know, not much money. And so that's one of the drive has been a lot of the driving factors until now is, is cost. But as we get closer to real technology demonstrations that we need to know if they're going to work or what's going to fail, uh, getting higher fidelity simulants in the mix is a major consideration. And it's a major focus of NASA's Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative. There are these uh, amorphous particles called agglutinates, uh, which are very glassy kind of, um, uh, it's like the, the impact glass from uh, micrometeor, you know, constant bombard bombardment, but there's also um, uh, glass particles that, um, uh, what's the term when they're actually from volcanic uh, type processes, I'm not thinking of the word right now, but um, the simulants that we have that we work with don't have any of those types of particles 
typically like JSC1 and LH1 because they're very difficult to manufacture. It's very difficult to emulate that process. There are two companies who have figured out how to manufacture them. Uh, Outward Technologies is one, they used to be called Blue Shift. The other one is Off Planet Research. Um, there are a couple of other simulant providers and basically it's really expensive, but it may, they may account for anywhere from 20 to 60, 65% of the regolith can have these amorphous agglutinated particles. And that's gonna likely make a big difference in terms of the chemistry and in terms of the uh, processing. These agglutinated particles are very, very fine. They collapse, they're, they have ex they're extraordinarily asymmetrical and, and they're just all these odd shapes and they're really sharp. But as soon as you start messing with them, they start to break apart. So that, you know, how that's going to affect machinery, especially on a long-term, you know, long duration operations, how it's going to affect chemistry, because a lot of the stuff that we're working on is soil consolidation chemistry. Mm. What kind of reactants can we take up? What kind of things can we mix in to solidify the soil to help the dust or, you know, to minimize the dust and also to give some structural um, you know, stability and, and that sort of thing. Those are areas that we're very focused on. And so our first step is actually to do some advanced characterization of the agglutinated particles and understand how that's gonna change things. So All right. That's <laughs> yeah. Every, I know that was everything kind of a long there. explanation. No, that's good. Yeah. Every, everything over there is the is the unexpected. And for folks wanting more information, uh, this thing we're talking about called CLASS, it stands for, I have it on my resources page for the, the webinar I just did, the Center for Lunar and Asteroid Surface Science. <laughs> and, and I'll link to it in the description, uh, the video description below. And you can go check that out. There are so many um, recorded lectures in there. I was going to say. You would be busy for a month, easy. I really want to plug their economic yeah. geology seminar mm. that's going on right now. It may have just wrapped up. I actually had to miss it on yeah. Monday, but I've sat through almost all of them. And if you want a crash course on lunar science, and it does spend a few seminars on asteroid, asteroids as well, um, it's, it's, bar, it's bar none, one of the best ways to, to get there. And I'm shocked that it doesn't have a uh, wider participation. I know people are busy. It's on a Monday but they're all recorded. You can't afford to be second best. You need to be first, and that requires speed. Now, if you're thinking that growth is supposed to be slow and steady, frankly, the way I was taught back in the 90s in the operations management and business administration programs, you are too slow. We have to adapt. And in space, it's no different than anywhere else. People like to think they're special in space, and it is fun, all the stuff we get to work on, but... Business is business. The fundamentals nowadays are conservative growth is not good. You need to run as fast as you can and risk outstripping your supply lines, which means in our world, using up the capital that we've got. That's a risk. But there is no prize for second place. There certainly is no prize for third. If you want to scale operationally fast, come talk to us at Cold Star Tech. We are the process experts for scaling fast. Now back to the interview. Now you spoke at one of those class events. You had a couple other speakers that you were on with. So just tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and what you were sharing. So the seminar we gave was called um, Geomaterial Science Methodology for Lunar In-Situ Construction. And hmm. it's back to this idea of we can't, we don't have the luxury of going and doing geotechnical tests, geotechnical site assessments right now uh, on places that we think we may want to build. So what can we do to um, have a decision-making framework so that as we do start getting more data, we can basically refine our modeling capabilities to uh, take them all the way from very micro scale, mesoscale up to macro scale kind of materials formulation and testing. This is uh, a, the same framework and we call it geomaterial science methodology that we're adapting because it is obviously for earth-based applications initially and it was funded research by the military, um, by ERDIC, the Engineering Resource 
Development Center, I believe is what that stands for. It's Army, Army Corps. And when they go out into new, you know, they call them in theater uh, areas like in the desert where they need to set up operations and they want to use local sands and soils and aggregates and, you know, uh, different types of binders like geopolymers um, and different uh, reactants and, and additives to be able to do in situ 3D printing and, you know, just start to um, not just for automation, but actually for uh, just being able to use the resources that are there. And that's the same thing that we're trying to do on the moon, right? It's all this whole ISRU arena is not just for the moon. It's actually something that's being developed in a lot of terrestrial, you know, civilian and military applications. We've actually been 3D printing with clay um, mm. here in our lab uh, that we were, a, a team here was doing before I showed up and said, that's what we need to do for the moon. Let's do that with regolith. <laughs> they, they were like, great. But it, there, so there was already this, uh, this framework that was being developed. And so that's what we presented on, but we were presenting basically like, this is what's possible. But as you said, and you know, Paul, I'm sure exemplified, the lunar environment is completely different. And in a lot of ways you, you got to forget what you know, you mm -hmm. got to forget what you think, you know, it does take some time to unlearn those assumptions, those things we take for granted. And until you really immerse yourself in the environment of, of mm. lunar science for a while, it takes a while. So that is something that, you know, we're going to have to continue to work on because we're trying to bring s somewhat uh, traditional civil engineering and material science um, methodology to it. Uh, and there's va va a lot of validity in that process and that rigor, but there's, there's a lot of, uh, we're starting to learn the things that we don't know. And I'm sure there's lots of things, the unknown unknowns. So I'll give you another example of um, a gap that's very relevant. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Dunbar in our, in our uh, aerospace department is a former astronaut. She's flown, I can't remember how many shuttle missions. I think it was two, maybe three. And has done over 200 experiments on the space station and is leading several projects now. Uh, to do some more. And some of her fundamental research is in, micro flat, uh, is in microgravity fluid dynamics mm -hmm. and just understanding how the balance between surface energy and, surf and surface tension and buoyancy actually, you know, where that balance is and where a bubble, if you go from, you know, if you inject some gas into a liquid, when that's actually going to release, you know, as a bubble, as opposed to stay fixed on the surface or even stay beneath the surface. Um, they're inducing these, these gas phase uh, or, you know, liquid solid gas phase interactions and taking very high resolution, very high frame rate images to study very precisely how those bubbles are being formed because we don't have, it's such a fundamental thing. When do you get bubbles if you put, you know, if you inject gas into a, a, a liquid, but in, you can't, it's not a direct, you can't just sub in one six for the gravitational uh, factor. You mm. actually need empirical data on that. And that is going to inform all mass and heat transfer, uh, you know, equations um, or, you know, related uh, chemistry, which is everything, including the stuff that we're doing for soil consolidation. So. Um, they're getting experiments on the space station to do it in, in uh, you know, hypogee, but not yet anything has been designed that we know of for uh, lunar. So we're actually designing a payload right now, and we've applied for internal funding to, um, to fly that along with a, a few other experiments um, to start to, and that's gonna be data that will, that will inform the whole community, whether you're doing you know, human systems or chemistry or, you know, any of this. Yeah. Something, something as simple, you say clay 3D printing, right? On earth, no problem. On the moon, no. <laughs> the clay, the first thing, I don't even know anything about earth science, right? Besides like a high school class, but I know clay is damp. 
well, there ain't a whole lot of damp on the moon. Right. <laughs> That's right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. So going back to the material science methodology, yeah. you know, we, we've been making concrete, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of these, these thermodynamic models are, are all about um, hydrous, uh, you know, reactions and um, that's not an option. So mm. that's why we're looking at things like exothermic reactions to solidify uh, what they call thermiting. And um, so we're looking at a few different um, uh, reactants to do thermiting as well as um, geopolymerization of the, 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 uh, the regolith using different types of, of, of binders that, you know, thermoplastic is one that Swampworks has done a lot of work with so we're going to look into that as well but also look at some others and that's what our models can help you know it can help us determine and if we actually need to design new binders um, then that's what our models are, are going to help us do as well. Okay Nicole you said that this this particular new space age is different uh, what did you mean by that? It's very different from the Apollo days uh, because this is not just, you know, the United States versus Russia. Now there is that geopolitical element to it for sure, because China landed on the far side of the moon for the first time that anybody's done that about a year, well, it was a year in January, right? So they've been roving around and actually getting quite a bit of really good, interesting data. They are sharing their data, at least some of it. Um, very valuable uh, ground penetrating radar uh, data that's come out recently. So, but, you know, China has a very strong space program going on. We clearly tell, you know, all, with all the launches they're doing. Um, and since they're there, you know, we know that they're not, uh, they're not just thinking around, you know, they're, they're trying to explore the, the poles and see what's going on. So there is that element to it. But the other element is that there, it's this whole private private sector, uh, you know, force that, that is uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin and, um, you know, these uh, space titans, <laughs> to take a term from Delta V, which is another great book, if you guys want a book plug um, about asteroid mining. The, uh, these space titans are, are really changing the equation fundamentally and changing the, the, the possibilities of, of access to space. So, it's underpinning, you know, not just all the work that NASA is endeavoring to do and, and presenting formidable competition to the incumbents, you know, the big boys that have been around all the time for the whole time. But it's also, um, you know, helping to create a market with all of these other uh, smaller players. So that's, that's huge. That's a, a fundamental um, game changer in that we have a whole slew of private industry that are developing new business models and it's hard you know, I don't think anybody would say it's a, it's a sure bet of when it's going to, of, of, of when it's going to happen. But I don't think you have very many people who say that it's not mm -hmm. happening and that it's not going to continue to flourish. Um, whether or not it's, you know, it, NASA has to underpin and, you know, kind of fundamentally um, seed this market, but there are just a few gates that we get beyond when we start to prove that we can really get there and start, you know, accessing and mining the water. You probably saw the news recently on the space resources, um, the new directive that just came out from the Trump administration mm -hmm. that's really trying to um, establish a, a legal framework to uh, protect these, uh, you know, these investments in space resources, develop, resources development. So that was a huge boon, especially for those companies right now. Um, and I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I was surprised to see it come out amidst everything else that yeah. is happening. But um, it, said to, it said to me that they're still going, you're still going strong in that direction, which I think was a little bit of a, a question once all of the current you know, corona situation came, came down. Mm -hmm. so, Okay. So yeah, well, those are the key factors. And then I have to say, you know, we're not the only ones. It's not just us in China. It's Israel and India and Japan and, you know, ESA and the Middle East. And, you know, there are a lot of uh, space programs coming out and moving forward now. Right. Let's talk about some of the things that you're seeing about like, okay, so we send somebody to the moon, then what? 
right? What are, what are the fundamental problems that you're seeing about, okay, we get there, we've got to land, which again, sounds simple, but if you're going to land and create something and then land something else next to it, it's going to blow dust all over it, that nice sharp dust we talked about mm -hmm. that gets into everything. Um, what, what else needs to happen when we do lunar construction and, and start to create a permanent settlement there? That still remains specifically. So I think everyone agrees we're going to need landing pads, launch pads, mm -hmm. uh, berms for protection, for shielding. Berms are going to be, being able to build a berm is, it seems mm -hmm. so simple. You're just like, how do you, you're just pushing a bunch of dirt into a mound. Like we do that all the time. But because of the gravity, because of the lack of cohesion, because of the lack of, um, you know, humidity to like, you know, keep these things solid, it's, it's not that easy. You push this stuff around and it just blows a little Lights bit that off. way. Yeah. You know? It's more like dunes that can just very easily shape shift and morph. They don't have any real, you know, structural integrity. So that's going to take some serious uh, engineering still uh, development. So, and we're actually working on that specifically um, potentially with some new challenges coming up from NASA and some things that um, next time when we get together, I'll be able to talk about a little bit more, hmm. uh, most likely. But um, so, so landing pads and berms, you know, are kind of the two, the key ones. And then really just being able to create dust free zones, you know, to protect equipment, to make for repeat access, not just of the lander in a particular spot, but to to get your rovers and your um, even your, your your astronauts and and to get your equipments and your processing set up in areas that is that is already sort of you know dust controlled, um, those are going to be uh, from from our vantage point that we can that we've assessed so far. Those are going to be really the the initial infrastructure elements. The habitats I think are going to be much further beyond that. Because initial habitats will most likely be, you know, pressurized spacecraft that are landed and just kind of, you know, dedicated to that. So, I mean, we don't need yeah. to, yeah, we can, just like they built ISS, you know, we can build some very, very uh, elaborate, comfortable, I don't know if they'd call them luxurious or comfortable, <laughs> but, you know, they're designing habitats already that can just be basically landed. And when you get to these larger scale landers like what Blue Moon is, or like Blue Origin is, is building with Blue Moon and, and um, some of the bigger companies then, you know, modules for those big habitats will most likely be delivered for the foreseeable future as opposed to built in place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because digging ain't easy. Uh, you've got the regolith, and then easy. there's a foundational layer underneath there that's uh, quite a bit different. And, you've got and to simulating that all of that is 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 really tricky. So we're, we we've got our work cut out for us to try to do as much testing of that kind of stuff here on the ground, and then and then start doing some technology demonstrations hopefully in the next five years or so. Four or five okay. Let's talk about ISRU for a little bit. I'm going to link to a NASA page, um, I think that you shared with me a while back on it, um, down below in the description, but let's assume that the audience knows nothing. <laughs> what is ISRU and, and what are you doing uh, involved with it? Okay, um, so ISRU is uh, in situ resource utilization. It means using the resources that are in place. That's the literal definition. Mm -hmm. I call it uh, building off the land or, uh, I mean, I've heard other people call it that. So I think that that's a nice way to put it. Um, our program under our research program, we call it dust to structures. And it's that kind of, you know, I think it paints the picture really well of just mm -hmm. going in and just using the raw material that you have in front of you uh, and bringing as little with you as possible to turn that into uh, structures. So um, it could mean, you know, here, like I said, printing with 3D printing with clay, 3D printing with sand, you know, as one of your major uh, aggregate components. Um, and then, of course, in the case of lunar, look at working with the regolith. All right. Are, are there any specific research actually, areas? I, yeah, I, I, I want to say, I'm, yeah, yeah I, so I want to qualify all that and say I'm actually obviously looking at this through a construction lens. Mm -hmm. um, ISRU is actually much broader uh, from, you know, in terms of the way that NASA uses it, because we're also talking about 
how we use the water, you know, mm -hmm. for life support, for drinking, for radiation shielding, for breaking it down into propellant, which is the primary thing that we're trying to use it for. It's the whole reason all this stuff is happening is because mm -hmm. water will turn into liquid oxygen and hydrogen uh, propellant. So um, that is ISRU. Uh, uh, oxygen extraction from the regolith. There's a lot of oxygen in the regolith tied up in oxides. So you can do electrolysis to release the oxygen and, and create a, you know, uh, for, for breathing as well as, uh, again, for, um, for fuels. And um, so that's ISRU. You can also get metals, um, titanium, mm. uh, other material, uh, other uh, the minerals like silica and aluminum and uh, not a lot of calcium, a little bit, um, but primarily I think titanium and silica and um, uh, that can be used for, you know, as, as, as building uh, more sort of material, you know, uh, components or for, uh, or metals for, for material fabrication. So that's all ISRU. I don't know that there's a case right now because of the way, how much extraction energy it would take to do the extraction on those. Um, there is a case for doing regular consolidation for infrastructure. I don't know if there's actually a case for doing like metals extraction for building uh, things out of metal, um, but, but that would technically be ISRU as well. Right, right. Yeah, that'd probably be a bit more challenging on the moon. I remember uh, Paul Van Suzante mentioned a project he's working on, I think, uh, for Mars, or mm -hmm. something like that, which obviously mm -hmm. has a different composition yeah. altogether. Yeah. Is there... well, it's, it's a lot easier to grow stuff on Mars, too, so you can use all uh, of the, the bio, you know, right. the fungi, and um, mm. maybe bovine serum. It's got an atmosphere. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's a good start. <laughs> and a lot of water, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess so, doesn't you ask, but. <laughs> um, in general terms, is there a settlement timeline for the moon? Uh, NASA's timeline is targeting lunar settlement, meaning um, uh, sustained operations for as early as 2028. Hmm. Um, so right around the 2030 kind of mark, I think, is, is when we hope to see a uh, real, you know, kind of things really working. Um, so that, that's, that's what they say. I'm certainly not an expert on all of the, you know, probabilities and contingencies right. and things that are going to, but that's, that's what the Artemis mission is, is setting mm -hmm. forth right now. Right. Okay. Well, is there anything that you wanted to share with the audience that we haven't discussed? I, um, I, I, there are a couple things, there's some things that we have in the works, as I mentioned, okay. that, yep. um, that we'll be developing and, you know, it'd be great to, to share right. uh, down the road a little bit. I would like to congratulate all of the recent um, winners of the, the, the NIAC uh, mm. phase one mm -hmm. challenge. There were some really, really cool concepts that came out of that mm. and teams who I know have been working really, really hard. Um, we had one in and we came close. We didn't get selected, but um, I'm delighted that we, we even, you know, uh, did as well as we did uh, considering the, the formidable competition that there was. Um, so that was encouraging and it was great to, to, to be working with the teams both internally and, and external to A&M uh, now that we are. So we're going to definitely keep that going and hope to share more in the near future. Right, real soon. All right, my guest has been Nicole Shoemaker, Research Specialist at Texas A&M. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me, Jason. It's great to talk to you. Hey, this is Jason Kanigan, the host of the Cold Star Project and the founder of Cold Star Technologies. I've decided to do something new. I've started doing daily update videos on who I met and what I learned the previous day in the space field. And it's a great sort of follow me thing. You can learn what I learn. I'm meeting a heck of a lot of people and learning a lot of things really fast. And the space field is really disparate. There are tons of nooks and crannies to go into and explore from legal, operational, you know, regulatory compliance and gosh the end customer who would have thought about that right
So you can sign up for this. If you go to coldstartech.com slash MSB, that's short for Make Space Boring, the mission we're on, then you can sign up and in your email you will get a daily notification that the new video has been posted. I'm also thinking about doing some branded mini courses and summarizing papers as uh, I'm able to. So those will be some goodies that are in there as well. So if you're interested in that, go to coldstartech.com slash MSB and join us on the mission to make space boring.